Good afternoon. Welcome to the second of three webinars hosted by Boston University's Advisory Committee on Socially Responsible Investing, otherwise known as the ACSRI. I'm Bob Brown, president of Boston University and an ex-official member of the ACSRI. Boston University Board of Trustees established the advisory committee to respond to faculty and student concerns about investment holdings. This body researches and reviews relevant investment practices and can make recommendations directly to the Board of Trustees. The ACSRI is currently studying climate change and fossil fuel divestment in order to advise the board, which will be reviewing as planned its 2016 decision about fossil fuel investment that accompanied the launch of the university's climate action plan. We are hosting a series of forums on climate change and fossil fuel divestment to engage the community in this discussion. The student members of the ACSRI will be hosting conversations with students on both the Charles River and medical campuses later this month. Through the forums, the committee will be updated about current energy policy, investment strategies, and climate change in order to develop their recommendations to be offered to the board later this spring. The audience is invited to submit questions throughout the event using the Q&A function. We will be recording the webinar and posting it to the ACSRI website. Today's forum, Climate Change, the Global Dimension, features Adil Nishan. Adil is the inaugural dean of the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies and is also professor of international relations in earth and environment at the College of Arts and Sciences. He was co-author of the third and fourth assessments of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, work for which the scientific panel was awarded the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. His research focuses on issues of global public policy, especially those related to global climate change, South Asia, Muslim countries, environment and development, and human development. Joining him as moderator is Janine Ferretti, who recently was appointed Vice President and Compliance Officer Ombudsman at the World Bank Group. Prior to taking this position, Janine was Professor of the Practice of Global Policy Development at the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies. Her interests include international development, in environmental issues with a particular focus on strategies for advancing solutions to key global and regional challenges. And now I'll turn the program over to Adil. We look forward to your insights. Thank you very much, President Brown. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and my gratitude also to the committee for giving me this opportunity to speak to this committee and to the community again on this very, very important and timely issue. Let me, let me first put up some slides and what I want to do uh, in my time is to uh, extend the conversation that started last week uh, with the first of these presentations that were given by my colleagues, Professor Cutler Cleveland and Peter Fox Penner. And they talked about, about where we are with the climate science, particularly in terms of energy. And I want to extend that uh, to start talking and thinking about where are we in this global moment uh, in terms of climate change as a global issue and its impacts in particular. So I'm going to focus on global, I want to focus on impacts and adaptation, and I'm going to focus uh, on the future in, in, in the few minutes I have in, in, in the hope that we can extend that conversation and build on what you've already uh, heard from, from my colleagues. In doing so, I want us to think about three questions, if you will. Um, they may not all be questions that are easily answerable, but I think, um, uh, or easily answered, but they are questions that I think we all um, 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 would be well served to think about. The first of those questions is, of course, the question that we are here for. What new have we learned about climate change? 
uh, and particularly since the last five years when 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 I had the uh, honor to speak to this community and this committee. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a glimpse of the answer to at least that one. I won't do that for all three of the questions, but at least on this one, what you've learned is that a lot of the things that we thought uh, would happen because of climate change, in fact, did happen. Uh, we've also learned that a lot of those things happen faster, both on the negative side and the positive side. That climate, in fact, has been changing in many ways faster than expected. That some of the things that we were thinking might happen later have already begun happening earlier, and I'll talk about that. But on the technology development side, on the positive side, and this has also come as a surprise, that development has taken off faster than expected in a number of areas. The adoption of technology may not be, but technological development is, is certainly something that's giving people some sense of hope. But let me not go into all of it here. I did want to highlight that at the beginning. The second question, and the one I'll spend the most time on is, what does it mean to live in what I have been calling in my recent writings as well as, as, as uh, public policy engagements, the age of adaptation? Uh, I will argue that we now live in the age of adaptation and we will be living continue to continue to live in the age of adaptation. And I want us to think about for a few moments, what does that mean and, and how is that different from where we have been, which is mostly a focus on mitigation. Um, I will make the distinction in a little while. And the third and final question, maybe the most important one uh, spread throughout this talk is how how we talk about climate change might need changing and might already be changing. The way we think about it, the way we talk about it, how that might be changing uh, and, and, and why that is important. So those are the three big questions that I hope you will stay with me um, as, 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 as I expand them in the next 20, 25 minutes. Uh, let me begin with Paris. Um, the last time, five years ago, when I spoke to this committee, I had literally landed off the plane from the Paris conference, which hadn't yet ended. Uh, and I had literally, from the airport, uh, come, come to the hall and we were doing it in person. Um, out of Paris, two big things came, three numbers, two ideas. And, and I won't go into the details. I am assuming, I am sure I'm talking to people who understand climate change, who understand the basics. So I'm going to leave that aside and move straight into what came out of that in policy. The big number that came was this number. And at that time, I must confess, it seemed like a much bigger number than it seems like today. Uh, no one believed it. I didn't believe it then. I, that, that, that this would be this would be the number that would actually actually be spent, but this number was 100 billion. And one of the things that the Paris Agreement said was that somehow in order to implement it, that is the level of investment that will be needed. And the policy idea was that instead of mandating the investment, this investment would come from corporations, it would come from individuals, it would come from policy and countries, it would come from Boston University and how it builds its new buildings, it will come from you in how you adopt a electric vehicle and so on and so forth, it would come from corporations changing their ways, it would come from countries, and all of that would add up to a hundred billion. People rolled their eyes, I did myself, because a hundred billion, you know, you have to figure out how many zeros there are. Now I say this as, as I highlight this because since then, we have had to play with much bigger numbers in response to disasters, uh, including in this last year and right now, when now a trillion seems to be the going rate for, for, for how, how we have to think about, about disasters in, in, in just one country. Uh, but I, I put that number, and at this point, uh, that was the idea out of Paris, that that's the level of investment needed. The other number is a much more, even more important number. And this was a range, 1.5 to 2 degree. 1.5 degree to 2 degree. And that, the idea was that voluntary as the agreement is, the nations of the world came together and said, we will try, we will try, try is the operative word, to do things as governments, as institutions, as individuals, so that we can limit global increase in global temperature to below 1.5 and no more and 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 some and and 
idly below 1.5 and certainly below two degrees centigrade. And I'll talk about that a little. The two degree is really what most industrialized countries, including the United States, were pushing for. 1.5 came because a lot of countries, about a third of the countries, many of them small, many of them island states, all of them poor, argued that 1.5 was too late, especially if you're a small island state. By that time, you may actually not be there. That the, the issues for them were far more urgent and they were truly existential. And therefore, this thing came that 1.5 is needed. Now, now comes the bad news. At least I would argue, and, and I'm happy to take questions on this later. At this point, the serious sign suggests, and, and this is a great tragedy as well as a great adversity, that there is no way, no way that we are going to reach 1.5. I think many people, including myself, keep hoping that maybe we will, maybe if we try everything, we can get there. And theoretically, yes, it is possible. But given what we have done since Paris, given where the goal is, it seems to me that the math just does not add up. And in some ways, the race is on for two, but, 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 but this, this number becomes important because as I said, for, uh, for, for a very large proportion of the earth, uh, 1.5 is itself very near the threshold of what counts existential. But hold those numbers in, 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 in your mind. Um, some of my colleagues might say that it is too early to say that can't happen. And I hope they are right. I hope I am wrong. I very much hope I am wrong. But why, 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 why do I suggest this? I'm not going to go deep into the science, but let me at least show you two, two pictures. Um, this is, and I hope you can see this on your screen and you can see that squiggle happening in the circles. This is actual recorded temperature for every month ever since we have had that record in the 1800s. And look at what is happening to that. So that is for every month. The first red circle is for 1.5. The next one is for two. This graph stopped at 2016. I will tell you in a little while what has happened since 2016. And, and what has happened is you are now at that 1.5 line, but I'll come to that in a minute. But more importantly at this point is not just where 1.5 and two degrees are, but what has been happening as that circle sort of, you saw that increase over, over time. And this is not about projection. This is not about prediction. I have purposely chosen a year that is past. This is data of what has already happened. And this is about the point that I, I want to leave us with today, that climate change is no longer a future issue. It is an issue today. And for at least two, 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 two billion to two and a half billion people, it is happening right now, right here, but I'll come to that. Now you might be watching this and saying, okay, well, that's global temperature. And global temperature might, might mean something scientifically, but I don't live on a globe. I live in a place on the globe. And I, I've been shoveling snow here in Boston. So what, what are you talking about? So let me take that same number, the same data and show you what it looks like for the same period starting 1880, every year that we have recorded temperature, what has been happening to wherever you might be on this planet? Uh, we are at 27, 1932, 1945, 1952. Just keep looking at that picture, keep looking at the color, keep looking at what is happening. It is the same manifestation of the same data of what has actually been happening. This is not projection. This is actually what has been happening to global temperature. And that, and, and not just global temperature, but global temperature spread across, across the world. And if you look at that picture and those colors carefully, and you match it with what you have been seeing in your newsfeed or newspaper, if you still read those things, or seeing, seeing on your Twitter feed, uh, you will start seeing why the stories come from certain parts of the world and why the stories, including if you look at the map of the United States, uh, why is it that the stories you hear uh, tend to come from California more than Massachusetts at this point? But more importantly was that stretch of color that you have seen. And the point I'm trying to make is it is global. It is global in how climate change happens. It is global because the climate system, the science of climate chemistry is global. I might need a, a, a passport if I travel by road from Boston to Montreal and I will need to show something at the, at, at the checkpoint, but the carbon molecule from my car does not. 
And that's why it is global. By the way, if you see those, those very colorful lines at the back, they do look nice. If we were still in the time that, 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 that we met in person, I might have been wearing a tie with that design or socks with that design. That design is not just colorful. That design, again, is another manifestation of the actual recorded temperature of the world, the global, global mean temperature, and how that has changed ever since we have been recording it uh, back back in the late 1800s. And again, all of this to suggest that one point uh, that global is important. So if global is important, I return to that 1.5 that Paris said we have to try for, and which it seems at this point, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But it will take it will it will take my, not just minor miracles, but minor 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 major miracles from each one of us to even get close. But why does 1.5 matter? Now you might be saying, you know, uh, this this is all okay, but what is 1.5 between friends? So the IPCC, which was mentioned earlier, which is a group of scientists, I'm no longer serving there, did a recent report that um, on 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 exactly that question: How close are we to 1.5? and what might happen to 1.5. Now, before I say something about that, let me put this picture, uh, which is about where we are and where we need to be in the future. The future is undated. But this is a picture that you, those of you who might have been at the first seminar might have seen Professor Cutler Cleveland put up. And there was even a question about it. If you see that big line, which says emission peak, uh, it, go, it happens after today, which means we hope emissions will peak. That doesn't mean that we know emissions will peak. But the really important thing is the steep fall in that dotted line. Not just a fall, but a fall that would be needed to go into negative emissions if the temperature overshoot is to be avoided. And in fact, it is unlikely to be avoided. That's what that orange area is telling you. Now, there was a question, as there should have been, and Cutler rightly pointed out, that's one hell of a steep line. And that is very, very near wherever today is. In fact, it is nearer to today uh, than it was when this graph was first made about a year ago. And so what is required is not just reducing, not just sort of moving slightly down, but a dramatic shift if those goals are to be met, a dramatic nearly turning off of everything, which is not possible, which is not even maybe desirable. And that explains the magnitude now, for, for certainly reaching 1.5, but even for reaching 2 degrees centigrade or, or, or maintaining less than 2 degrees centigrade. My apologies to scare you uh, on this afternoon, but what does that mean? As I said, you know, what is, what is half, a, half a degree centigrade between France? And those of us who live in Boston know that, you know, we can, we can, we can see that sort of a change within three hours. We see more of change from morning till evening, as, as was famously said, don't like the weather, just wait, it'll change. Well, climate doesn't change as often as weather changes, and that's the critical thing. So what does a 0.5 degree difference mean between 1.5 and 2? 2 is bad. 2 is real bad. 2 is crisis. But 1.5 what does the difference mean if, if even, even what is the difference between, between those two? Uh, how, how big is the difference? This again is from that IPCC report. I won't go into all of it, but, but to give you a glimpse. A world that can, can hold, hold stratospheric uh, climatic um, increase in, in temperature uh, to 1.5 rather than two is 2.6 times, 2.6 times less on, uh, on the impacts in terms of extreme heat. Be read that in. If we can limit it to two, we still have a huge impact, which is a 14% uh, change in extreme heat. What does extreme heat mean? Extreme heat means three years ago in Mumbai, India, 700 people dying because of heat. Extreme heat means in the last four years continuously, over 100 people dying just of heat in, 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 in Karachi. Extreme heat means what you might remember from Paris some years ago. Extreme heat means what you've been seeing in Australia. Extreme heat means what you've been seeing on the West Coast in California. If we can reduce it to two, we are still looking at a 14% increase. 
if you if you if 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 you, if you uh, so, sorry if you can reduce it to 1.5 if we can keep it at 1.5 if it goes to 2 uh, you are talking about 2.6 times more at 37% the sea ice in the arctic the loss of uh, sea ice in the arctic could get 10 times worse with that 0.5 degree differential coral reefs nearly 30% worse if because of that 0.5 uh, 0.5 difference sea level rise 0 0.06 meter difference because of a 0 0.5 degree so i put that and i hope you breathe that in this is important to start seeing you know what these minor changes once you break the threshold what a minor change can do to various essential existential systems of the planet and, and I wanted to put that up and we can come back to that in the question and answer if, if, if need be. But I want to move on to the points that I do want to make about policy and global. Uh, I have taken, probably plagiarized the title of this slide, A Year Like No Other from President Brown, uh, who I think used that line in the, in the end of year letter that he sent to the community. But, but I think all of us have, have been feeling like the last year was a year like no other. Uh, so maybe, maybe now that we are in 2021, we might want to look back at the year like no other, uh, but look back at it from a different lens. So let me remind you what happened in the year like no other, uh, apart from the other things that were happening. January, hottest January ever recorded, January 2020. Hottest January ever recorded. February, second hottest February ever recorded. March, second hottest March ever recorded. April, second hottest April ever recorded. May, hottest May ever recorded. June, hottest June ever recorded. July, second hottest July ever recorded. August, second hottest August ever recorded. September, hottest uh, September ever. October, third, third hottest October ever. Okay, so it was a good, it's a little respite, just third. Uh, November, hottest November ever recorded. We ended on a better note. December was only the eighth hottest December ever recorded. Uh, just breathe that in. Just breathe that in, what that means. What that meant was by a hair, by a hair, 2020 became the hottest year ever recorded. But that's not important. I'll tell you what's important. There have been seven years since 2014. The seven hottest years ever recorded were those seven years between 2014 and 2020. No surprise that the last decade was the hottest decade. The last seven years include all the, all the seven hottest years ever recorded. And that's the point that I'm talking about, that thinking about climate change as a future issue is no longer viable, is no longer defensible. Let me stay, allow me to please stay with me on just two more minutes on, on this year of the pandemic. Uh, during the year of the pandemic, we at the party center for the longer range future, uh, which is, uh, you know, when, when the pandemic started, we said, okay, there is going to be a day after COVID. <laughs> We didn't know how long it would take, but we said there will be a day. So back in March, we said we talked maybe to six, seven people who are really smart and asked them what the world after COVID might look like. By the time we ended this in August, at the end of the summer, we had spoken to a hundred really big experts. We had spoken to prime ministers like from Italy. We had spoken to, 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 to Nobel winners. Uh, we had spoken to at least one chief of staff of the White House. We had spoken to a ex-director of the CIA. We had spoken to all sorts of people. Mostly this was about what might happen to politics, what might happen to the economy. Most of them were on the economy. But here, what I want to show you is a short short clip, which brings together some of the things we heard in terms of what we are talking about today, not just climate, but sustainable development. When people thought about what was happening and what it meant for the world of, of a post-COVID world, here is some of the things we heard. I don't think one can even mention sustainability unless you recognize that ecosystem health equals Human health. Humanity is placing too many pressures on the natural world. 
with damaging consequences. What happens in the long term to biodiversity is going to depend on the course of our collapse. We also need to make sure we prioritize a food future that coexists in harmony with nature. The big problem, of course, is that problems of poverty and problems of inequality impinge on the question of food availability. It's now the 21st century and there are still 800 million people worldwide that don't have access to safe and affordable drinking water and over 2 billion people worldwide that don't have access to adequate sanitation services. Even without a pandemic, even without a public health crisis, that is a public health crisis. 75 years from now, we're going to run the world on sun and wind because it's cheap and clean. But if it takes 75 years to get there, the world that we run on sun and wind will be a broken world. We have many opportunities to really transform our economy as we come out of COVID. We need to come back with a cleaner economy. We should be able to make our societies more resilient, grow the number of jobs, and actually grow the security of our energy system. Do we prop up the fossil fuel industry or... Do we, as we did during the recession, choose to make an investment in green technologies? You now have these extraordinary sums of money being mobilized overnight. We could not find it in ourselves for the past 10 years to find a way to mobilize $100 billion in order to accelerate our collective capacity to move towards a low-carbon economy. We have another global pandemic, global planetary emergency looming. And can we use this opportunity, can we learn from this to actually fix the way for the future? The coronavirus pandemic, in my view, is a harbinger of a much, much bigger emergency to come. And everybody is now seeing that. The bottom line is that our recovery from this pandemic must guide us to a more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient future. I showed that because, A, these are some really, really smart people. We did 101 interviews. Each was only about five minutes long. But the interesting thing is we talked to them about climate change, or many of them we asked about climate change. And what they start talking about are the things that you heard. And there's a reason why they are talking about food and water and impacts and economy and 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 and, uh, and 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 investment and so on and so forth and that really is what i want to focus in the rest or rest of my, my my limited time here because that brings us to this notion that i had introduced which is my argument that we are now already living in what i call the age of adaptation now first in terms of climate there are these two key words they're probably two of the most important words in, in sort of climate policy or in climate science one is called mitigation one is called adaptation. Mitigation is essentially the things that you do to mitigate, to keep the problem from happening. Things that you do you so that carbon doesn't go uh, increase so that the problem doesn't happen. Adaptation is what you do if the problem does happen and then you have to adapt to the impacts of that problem, right? That's the most sort of basic thing. We as a species are actually very good at adaptation. Uh, in many ways, our dominance as a species has come because we are so good at adaptation. The fact that I'm wearing a sweater is adaptation. There is, there is, there is climate out there and I adapt to it by wearing a sweater so that I don't have to heat, heat, heat this room uh, super heavy. Uh, it rains, I take a, 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 an umbrella. That's adaptation. But one of the things that we've learned in the last year, if we've learned anything, is that adaptation, when you don't do enough precaution, is extremely, extremely expensive and difficult. We can adapt. We can adapt to having this meeting on Zoom rather than in person. That's adaptation. In many ways, Bob Brown is now the chief adaptation officer of Boston University. I am the dean of adaptation of the Pardee School. Each one of us have had to adapt. But one of the lessons we learned is the less prepared you are before a crisis hits in, the more difficult and more costly that adaptation is. And that is why adaptation is a central uh, argument in climate policy and why there is so much impact now on, on adaptation because it has become inevitable that even if we do the best we can, there will be impacts. And that is why when you build new building at BU or anywhere in Boston, you try to think about where you're going to put all the stuff you used to put in the basement because the basement may have water in a world that has sea level rise as a real likely possible 
danger in the future. That is the type of thinking that adaptation kicks in. And what I'm suggesting is that the world is now beginning to think not just about mitigation, which is reduce reduce the likelihood of the impacts, but also adaptation because even in the best case scenarios, there are some levels of adaptation to climate change that will happen. How did we get there? A tragedy in five pictures. I will try to sort of rush through this very, very quickly uh, because I understand, understand my time. The first is this is one of the most depressing graphs in all, all of science, I think. It is a failure of wisdom. This is an old graph, but it only becomes worse if you have it, have it, have it more recent. Between 1991, 2012, 13,950 peer-reviewed climate articles were published, peer-reviewed scientific papers on climate change, only 24 of which rejected global warming as a human-induced concept in any way. At this point, you're, you're, the, number, the proportion has gone even worse. So it is not that we haven't known it is somehow that we turn this into two sides when there really aren't two sides. There are very few scientific concepts that have the type of agreement that you just saw, maybe, maybe gravity, maybe not. Uh, it is a failure of negotiation. I won't go into it, but 25 years of constant negotiations and countries kicking, kicking the can, can, can forward, first at, at Kyoto, then at Copenhagen, uh, in some ways at Paris, but, 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 but wanting to do, not finding the way to move negotiation into actual policy at the levels that is needed. Uh, it is a failure, not just of, of, of negotiation, it is a vulnerability failure. Again, very briefly, if you look at those two graphs, you don't need to read every country. But the first one on your left tells you which parts of the world are most likely to be hurt by climate change, which are most vulnerable to it. And the other part shows you which parts of the world has historically caused the problem. And that mismatch, that mismatch is going to define the future as it has the current uh, politics of climate change. And that vulnerability failure leads directly to, to what many developing countries would argue is a moral failure. If you look at this graph that will come up and it comes from Standard & Poor who rate countries by their potential vulnerability. And again, you look at the map and you look at where the likely the deepest impacts are going to be. And, 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 and you see why this is such a volatile issue in, in, in terms of global politics as well as global policy. It is also a failure of politics. I put this picture for the last few years, I would have put the picture of the then US president because of the US moving out of Paris. But the fact is it is not one president or one administration or one country. It is in fact, all countries of the world developing industrialized, uh, all countries of the world kicking the can down the road. I show this picture to my students and ask them what it reminds them of. And one of the things that they often say is it reminds them of that all-nighter uh, you pull the night before the paper is due. And in fact, it is that picture. This is from Copenhagen right before the agreement kind of failed. These world leaders, Mr. Obama, the prime minister of Britain, of Germany, uh, the head of EU sitting there with, with some food, trying to solve a problem and knowing really that it is too late. And then, then uh, for those of you who follow it, you know what happened at, 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 at Copenhagen. The point I'm saying is that this, this failure to mitigate has brought us to the age of adaptation. As I start wrapping up, what does the age of adaptation mean? And where does the hope come from? I might sound sort of uh, shock treatment here, but in fact, there is hope in my story. Uh, there are seven disasters, I hope, which are waiting to be averted. And in, if they are averted, there are opportunities in these disasters. I work on developing countries, so a lot of what you will see is developing country focused, but it is in fact the same. I start not with energy, but with nature. And I start on that not only because uh, we live in this moment of pandemic, but because you mess with nature, nature will push back. Usually, if someone was talking about nature and climate change, they will show you a picture of an ice slab with a polar bear. I don't like that picture. Uh, because I don't think that picture is entirely honest. I have spoken to a few polar bears. They are not waiting for you and me to come and save them. Uh, nature doesn't wait to be saved. Nature retaliates one way or the other. And that is why I think this picture is a better picture, but an even better picture is this one. And I've purposely not gone down the road of, of, of coronavirus, which is also being talked about again as a zootonic 
disease and so on and so forth, this is the dengue mosquito. And the dengue mosquito is changing its habitats, partly because of globalization, partly because of more travel, but many people think partly because of climate change, because the mosquito adapts to changing climate and find itself in places where it wasn't before. And that leads to the very, very serious concern that a lot of people in the climate, as well as the epidemiological world have about how a changing climate will change vector bone disease. And again, with the moment we live in is a moment that you, you, you have thought more about this anyhow. Uh, in many ways, the, the signature issue of the world of adaptation is water. In the world of mitigation, we usually talk carbon. Right? So mostly if you are interested in reducing climate change from happening, you focus on carbon. If you focus on carbon, you essentially focus on energy because that's where most of it is coming from. You come to the world of impacts, a lot of what we will talk about will be written in the, in the language of water. What do I mean? Think about what happens if climate changes. A lot of what happens is about water. Water disappears, drought. Water melts, glaciers. Water rises, sea level rise. Water falls from the sky like no one's business, extreme events. The point I'm making is that the front line of climate impacts is very often about water. And again, think about the headlines you've seen in the last few weeks, for the last few years. This is a picture from my country, Pakistan, 2010 major floods. But before I come to that, I wanted to put this picture. This is to scale. A, a, the total amount of fresh water in the world as compared to the, to the size of the planet itself. I should note, however, there is plenty of water. There is enough water. There is enough water. It is not that we don't have enough water. It is a question of access and distribution. But let's look at the flood and try to think about in a climate changing world with all the things that I'm talking about, what do these things mean for people? This is a map of Pakistan, the blue squiggle, dark and light blue squiggle, is the area that was covered by very severe or severe flood, right? So just keep an eye on that blue squiggle. I took the blue squiggle and put it on the map of the United States. That's the area it covers. Vermont down to Florida. I took the same squiggle to scale, put it on a map of Japan. Same squiggle to scale, put it on a map of Europe. Denmark, Denmark down to France. The point I'm trying to make is once you start talking about impacts of this level, then you have real impacts on people and that translates. Now, if you're talking about water, you immediately start talking about food because what is food except nature's way of packaging water? Not really quite that, but the link is so clear and I only want to put the headline there. Then you immediately start thinking about food as you saw in that clip. From, from one of the UN officials. We've already talked about energy and I want to only make one point and not delve on it because you heard some very, very powerful arguments about where we are with energy, including the great opportunities. In many ways, the, the reason I put this picture is there is about 3 billion people for whom the energy problem is not that they use too much energy, it is that they use too little energy. That's the question of energy poverty. Why is that related to what we are talking about? Those people will, as they should, as they must, want to increase that energy. And therefore, when we are talking about energy transformation, we are not just talking about meeting the needs that we have already, but we are talking about a transition that also brings people out of this energy poverty. Uh, that, that, that is a reality for about 3 billion people. On this one, I have the greatest hope. And this is again pictures very much like what you've seen, seen, seen before. And the reason I have hope, especially, is because that transition in technology, not always in ad adoption, but in transition in technology with the cost going down, uptake going up, has been very, very dramatic. One of the things, however, that you and keeps an eye on, on energy, this is something that came out two years ago. It is a report of the International Renewable Energy um, Agency on what might be the security uh, and economic security and energy security implications of an energy transformation. And, 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 and I had been part of that commission, but those are the type of things that people are talking about energy. What I really wanted to focus with energy, however, is we think about energy just in kilowatts and gigawatts, but energy does things. And the most interesting example to me is mobility. 
you start thinking about adaptation, you start thinking about the world. It is not simply whether my car is EV or a, a, a running on, on old style fossil fuel gasoline. The question is not the, just the type of energy. The question is mobility. The question is not whether I own the car or I get an Uber. Yes, it is the question. The question is, how do I get from place A to place B, which is both a human need, a human desire, a developmental aspect. And for a very large number of people in the world, it is not how their car runs. It is how to move from place A to place B. And that is why mobility is a larger, larger question, uh, again, in a, in, a, in a climate constrained world. Similarly, and I think on this one, there is probably even greater, greater possibility of positive action than, than, than in energy terms itself is infrastructure. And again, infrastructure is not simply a question of replacing the polluting with replacing with the, it with something clean. Infrastructure is again talking about a planet where there are massive unmet needs. And with mobility, with uh, infrastructure, the, the notion, the, the choice, the opportunity is of leapfrogging an entire world in this transformation. Why adaptation is not just about a band-aid, it can be a massive economic and developmental jump the same way that the cell phones were. The interesting thing about the cell phone is how quick the transition was in places that didn't have landlines because they didn't have to first take out the landline and put something else in place of it. They could immediately leapfrog to the, to the newer, newer technology and both for energy and infrastructure, that is an opportunity. Two more left, but, but, but these, these may be slightly more disturbing. One of them is refugees. Uh, we don't think of refugees and climate. There is a lot of people, including in the United Nations, including in the Security Council, including very serious scholars who are putting a lot of effort thinking about what a climate change world is going to do for not just immigration, but refugees. You think about refugees and you usually think of images like this. A big bad thing happens somewhere. In that moment, a lot of people get, 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 can no longer live where they are living. They move somewhere else. Climate migration, climate refugees need not happen like that. They are much more likely to happen as, in, uh, as economic migrants. A micro millimeter already happening, micro millimeter change in the mix of sea level and fresh water in the Sundarbans in Bangladesh. And the shrimp on which nearly a million people livelihood depends moves with that freshwater seawater mix and is no longer available to those fisher folk. What do those fisher folk do? Their livelihood is gone. They move first to Dhaka, then maybe to Chittagong. Maybe some arrive here in Boston. And the impact of this is, is, is something that is keeping environmental security and climate security people very, very concerned. Very quickly, look at this picture. This is from 1974. There is something called the parrot's beak. The parrot's beak is, if you see your bottom left corner, that's the beak. It's in Guinea, which is bordered by the country of Sierra Leone. Now look at the dark green where it says Guinea. And I'll move this picture from 1974, which you see, to 1999. What happened here? A lot of the dark green became light green. Why did that happen? If this was a class, I would have given you time to respond, but let me tell you, a war happened. Where did the war happen? The war happened in Guinea, which is still dark green. Why is it light, light green, not in Guinea, but in the Parrish Beak region? Because people don't like war. They left the war and they went to where they were safe. When they went there, they needed fuel wood. When they needed fuel wood, they started chopping it down as they should have because survival is important. And that is the type of challenges and opportunities that the age of adaptation gives us. Last slide, four points. What might climate action mean in the age of adaptation? In those pictures here, uh, when the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, visited, visited Boston University, amongst other things, this is the type of thing we talked about. Let me put four ideas of what this means for climate change in a global context in terms of opportunities as well as challenges. First, what it means is that not just the future, but even the present of climate discussion, which has been mostly energy, will go, move to climate equals nearly everything. In some ways that is scary, in some ways it is exciting. 
That is what a transformation looks like. We use the word transformation all the time. If you read Bill Gates' new book that came two weeks ago, that's what he's talking about. He's saying it's not simply a carbon molecule transition. It is an opportunity to create a massive transition in a whole number of areas. And that is where both the economic and the developmental activity will be. This doesn't mean energy is less important. In fact, it is as important. This means other issues are also now going to become more important. If we don't act on it, it will become more complex. If we act on it, there are opportunities. The second point that this adaptation world, the age of adaptation tells us, we have to move from development seen as a problem to development seen as a solution. Again, the cell phone example, the massive opportunity to leapfrog, whether it is in infrastructure, whether it is in vertical forests, uh, you know, buildings in South Asia that, that are green vertically, uh, whether it is in, in insulation, whether it is in building design, whether it is in mobility, but, but, but thinking that, that that big picture allows you that opportunity. It is moving from international action to also, not at the cost of international action, to local action, to this opportunity, as well as responsibility that lies at the institutional, at the individual, at the national level. And finally, to start looking at climate action, not simply as a cost, but also as an opportunity. The point, however, is the more it gets delayed, this is those graphs that you say, the more it becomes a cost. And again, if you think about what we've gone through in the last year, there are massive lessons here. The better ready you are when the crisis hits, and the crisis will hit, the better you are ready, the more opportunity you have to leapfrog. The less ready you are, the type of decisions you have to take are not the type of decisions that are going to make anyone comfortable. Thank you very much. Let me let me end there and let me invite my 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 colleague and friend Janine Ferretti to join me and, and launch us into a conversation. Thank you very much, Adel. I really, I, you know, I was listening to you and I was thinking what you're presenting was absolutely overwhelming in the sense of the nature of the crisis, the criticality of the crisis. But at the same time, you gave us a sense of we are the generation. And when I say the generation, I mean all of us, uh, faculty members, students, to be at this point, at this crossroads, really, of, of humanity and civilization. And you really gave us that sense of urgency. And one of the questions that um, people have been asking is a lot about the burden of pays for this. You started off your presentation about that big number. But I think the questions that I've been seeing are more about are there some countries that have a greater burden uh, that they must, um, they have in terms of paying for uh, these changes have to be made or the consequences of their uh, ongoing emissions, regardless of what the science has said? And are there, uh, what, kind of, what kind of burden sharing regime do you see there? How did this question of burden, why should, Somebody in the United States take action when we see, for example, one of the question, one of the questions were emissions going up in countries like China. Uh, thank you, thank you, um, Janine. Two or three things. I, I'm teaching a course this semester, the, the course on sustainable development that, 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 that you know well. And, and one of the things we are doing in the class is, is for our students here at Boston University to create a personal manifesto of sustainable development and say, okay, what can I do? And then, then measure it to see if it has an impact. That, that goes to this question of burden, burden not just in, in terms of who's to blame, but burden in terms of ability and burden in terms of responsibility. In a way, if you look at those maps that I see, it is not surprising. Energy led to emissions. The more energy you use, the richer you usually are. It's not a question of rich country, poor country. It's also within those countries, right? And again, we are seized in a moment in this country where those questions of justice and equity have become equally extremely important and the same apply, apply globally. In some ways, I have benefited from my emissions. And the vulnerability is that those who 
who, who are more likely to pay or pay earlier are somewhere else. And that is why a global solution is needed, but it also has to be an individual one. And that's why I mentioned my students because a lot of the action has to be individual. Now, I, I'm going to get instantly unpopular. It is very, very popular to bash on China because China has the most emissions. No, China doesn't have the most emissions. China as a country has more emissions because they have a billion people. They have about a third of the per capita emission that I do. And I'm not sure how many of that emission is theirs. Now, let me again push back. If I'm getting something on Amazon that is made in China and filling the stacks of Walmart, the emissions that got, went into making it, are they China's emissions or are they my emissions? Right? Now, I'm not trying to get philosophical here. What I'm trying to get is that the type of finger pointing that we've had in fact has defeated the purpose. And the purpose really has to be that we as a species have the ability to deal with it. It's, it's, a, it's a question about, as I said, you know, how, how, what, is, what is my driving pattern? Um, what is the carbon cost of, of, of those packages that keep getting delivered every day on, on, on my doorstep? And so on and so forth. So those individual decisions to the global national decisions and everything in between is how it's going to add up. Thank you, Adil. Uh, we've had also a number of questions about the priority or the kind of uh, implications of what is in front of us in terms of what has to be done. You listed those areas of priority action. How uh, climate really is a, is related to everything. How does that translate into development policy? Does, are we looking at a different kind of growth, a different kind of economic development? What, what, should, what advice would you give my boss now, David Malpass, about addressing these issues? Well, first of all, I'd say to David Malpass, why did you take her away from Boston University? Uh, <laughs> the second thing I would say to the World Bank and others, and there's also another question that I see there about degrowth. Uh, in, in a way, I think we need to interrogate the, the meaning of growth. Right? Um, and, and growth is a fairly recent term. I'm not saying it's wrong, but, but in a way, I think it's a fairly recent. It's not even 100 years old as a sort of major policy concept. And I think it, it's, it's taken on a life of its own. What you're really interested is in well-being. What you're really interested in is in development. What you're really interested in is in the quality of my life. Right? And, and growth by measuring it by a single indicator of more is always better. In fact, is not how you and I live. At some point, I love that burger, but after the fifth, it's really difficult to eat the sixth. And hopefully you don't even get to the fifth. The point I'm talking about is we need to rethink about, about development and we are rethinking, right? We are rethinking. There are many, many interesting things happening. People are rethinking about ownership of cars, right? I hope it goes the right way. I hope it doesn't mean I won't own it, but I'll still use it as much. Instead of saying, you know, the, the, the and automobile, automobile companies have themselves thought, right? Automobile companies are automobile companies, essentially in the business of making steel containers that contain hydrocarbons. Or are they in the business of making containers that we take people from point A to point B? If they are the later, then what goes into the engine, whether it is electric or whether it is hydrocarbon or maybe at some point hydrogen, is a secondary question of meeting that need of mobility. Right? That, is the, that is the leveraging of thinking about development as well-being. And again, I go back to this point, smart people, smart institutions, smart countries, if they start seeing the opportunity, then it's not a finger point question or finger pointing question of you did more worse than, than I did. It's a question of who is going to be the winner in the greatest transformation that has happened at least in a century, I would say much more. Right? They're going to be winners and losers. The winners are going to be those who, who look at this transition as this transformation for both the opportunities, averting the dangers, grabbing the opportunities. Thank you, Adeline. Our final question has to do with um, the issue of what kind of an international agreement would need 
would we need to see that would support that greatest transformation? One of our listeners said, what about having an agreement with more teeth or not? And we know about the Montreal Protocol. And um, so it's over to you. I, 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 I am, you know, I, I am amongst those who are not entirely a fan of things like Paris. I do think they need teeth. I think they need the right incentives. Uh, I hope, and this is a good moment. I, I think certainly Mr. Kerry, Mr. Biden seem really serious and the world seems to be wanting to do something. But I think if we get into the old model, you cause the problem, you give me money, I won't use the money and it'll go waste. That won't work. I think the incentives, people are ready to make the right changes. Incentivizing individuals for behavior change, incentivizing institutions for behavior change, incentivizing policy for behavior change so that it moves in the right direction is where, where I think it needs to go. And we've seen that with some of the energies, uh, energy transformation, particularly in solar and wind in various parts. So in some ways, this is, you know, we, let me end with this thought before I hand it back to President Brown for his closing remarks. In some ways, I think we as a species have the knowledge. We are a university. I know how to do this. I really do. Well, if I don't, my colleagues do. I know we as a species have the knowledge, the ability, the capacity to do what is needed. What I don't know is whether we have the wisdom to do it in time. I'll hand it back to President Brown for his closing comments. Well, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the ACSRI, I'd like to thank both of you for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. I think, Adil, your presentation is very thought-provoking and thorough. And I thank you to our audience for your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the ACSRI website. Please join us again this Thursday, March 4th at 4 p.m. for our next forum, Urban Heat, Rising Temperatures and Population Vulnerabilities in Cities, featuring Catherine Lusk, co-director and founding executive director of the Initiative on Cities, Lucy Hutira, associate director of the U.S. of the BU Urban Program and associate pro uh, professor of Earth and Environment, and Patricia Fabian, Associate Professor of Environmental Health in the School of Public Health. Uh, we look forward to having you with us on Thursday. Uh, have a good evening and thank you again.